Hi, I'm Graham, Managing Editor of the Cigar Lounger Magazine, and today I'm sitting with Fred. Fred is the owner of Nomad Cigars, part of the House of Emilio. Do I have that right? Yeah. Definitely. We're here at Cigar Mojo in King of Prussia, and uh, we're just going to chat a little bit. We're going to find out a little bit more about Nomad Cigars, what you guys are working on, what you have coming up in the future. And uh, before we turned on the camera, Vince actually had laid out one of our favorite questions, which is, in the history of mankind, if you could sit and have a cigar with anybody, who would that one person be? Mark Twain. All right, you're gonna have to give us some backstory. Why Mark yeah, Twain? I, man, have you read, if you've read like any of his quotes, I mean, he just sounds like a really cool guy to hang out with. I mean, you know, I mean, he smokes cigars, and just every quote I've ever read of his is just funny. I mean, just you know, not, you know, whether it's politicians or, or people or kids, you know. The, I mean, I remember the thing. And I remember literally because I had it when my daughter was a teenager. My, I had a great kid, don't get me wrong. So I just remember the quote when talking about teenagers. But I think he's the one that basically said, you know, when you, when you have a kid, you, you build a box and you cut a hole. And then you put the kid in the box and you use the hole to cut them, you know, to, to hand them food. Yeah. And when they get to be teenagers, seal the hole. So he just had so many of that these things that were just really funny and just... He, he kind of, you know, he's a cigar smoker and, and just seemed to live life and enjoy life. And yeah, I guess that's probably who I'd pick. That's a good one. Actually, I think that's one that we haven't heard yet. Actually, of all, of all the times we've asked that question. Really? You guys have never heard of Mark Twain? Never. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> now, speaking of funny, you are, and this is not brown nosing, uh, my favorite person to follow on Twitter. Because oh. I literally laugh out loud at some of the stuff that you... Post and for those of you that are uh, not familiar that's just with lack of, that's cigars, lack of options if I'm maybe, your favorite Twitter follower. Well, <laughs> I mean, really, in the cigar industry, is humor our thing? I'm I'm thinking it's not. Like donuts, that's our thing. You know what I mean? Uh, scotch, that's our thing. Yeah, definitely. Humor, maybe a little, maybe a little. But kidding aside, you're actually one of my favorite people to follow. Yeah. You're at Godfather. Yeah, G O D F A D R. Yeah. Where did that come from? Um, well, it actually came from when I rode motorcycles a lot, which I still ride motorcycles, and I rode with a, a group of people, and somehow the nickname of Godfather came out, and it was actually spelled correctly. Um, and what happened was is that when I transitioned to Twitter and I was doing everything, and I was kind of already stuck with it, so, um, but I found the spelling of Godfather spelled out correctly was horribly pretentious. Little. So, so, so I cut it and just made it G-O-D-F-A-D-R, and then just ran with that. All right. I actually I wanted to ask you that question since the day yeah. I started following. Yeah. I was like, I got to know. Well, and I wanted I wanted when I first was doing the Twitter thing. I actually wanted Nomad, but some guy in like North Korea or something like that has Nomad. And despite my trying to communicate with them and do the Google Translator to try to get it from them, it just ain't happening. North so, Korea. Yeah. You know, I think if you live in North Korea, he should just by virtue of being in North. And maybe Korea, South Korea, be... maybe somewhere else. I don't know. I, I don't remember. Someone told me what it was. So. I'm probably wrong, and now I'm probably just, we're probably at war. I right. probably really screwed that up. I probably, no, the Twitter thing I'm just having fun with because, you know, you know, I, I own a marketing company, and I am still participate a little bit with it, but the whole thing on marketing and stuff like that and, and behind my brand is who I am. I mean, we, we all have great cigars, or I should say we all do, but a lot of us have great cigars. We're all distributed, you know, en Enrique, myself, and the other guys, we're all distributed by House of Emilio. And we all have really good cigars. I'll recommend theirs, I smoke theirs, things like that. So one of the things in marketing is kind of getting behind that thing where the pitch is always like, buy my stick, buy my stick. Here's a picture of me with my cigar. Here's a picture of me with my cigar. Here's a picture of my cigar. And, and that has no value to me as far as learning about the brand and who's behind the brand. So the Twitter thing, 90% of what I tweet and, and, a, and a significant number of my followers may not be cigar smokers because I'll see a quote that's funny, I'll put it on Twitter, I'll see a quote I like, but I want to change it, so I'll rewrite it, put it something different, um, or I'll just come up with my own. And I'm just having fun with this, an outlet. I did stand-up comedy for like eight years when I lived in California, and it's just like my outlet. I think my wife looks at me and just like, oh my God, you're an idiot. But I'm just having fun. And that's it's what just, they do, that's part of the job description. It, it, it's it's in the manual, the it's yeah, in the manual, because we, we would never do anything stupid. Right. So, um, so to me, everything, from when I started the company and even even now, which is not much longer, you know, two years into it, uh, it's just a matter of, look, this is what I'm doing right, this is what I'm doing wrong, and it's refreshing, because I did the corporate thing years ago, it's refreshing to just be yourself. And like, this is how I am. Whether you like it or not, some people like it, some people probably don't like it, but this is, this is who I am, and oh yeah, and I happen to make cigars too. 
And, and that's, that's gone really well for me. And it's fun. It's easy. So for the people that are maybe are not nomad familiar, while Vince and I are often very much against the standard type questions, could you give us, you know, the, the 60 second overview of uh, what sticks you have out there yeah. or what their, the nature of their origin are, you know, things of that nature? Sure. Yeah, I started, I started Nomad uh, just about two years ago. And I've always had this thing for the last 20 years of trying to take a hobby or interest and turn it into a business. And I've smoked cigars for probably about 13, 14 years now. Okay. And I think I'm just one of the classics of, I'm a cigar aficionado. I love smoking cigars. I have some friends that are cigar makers and they said, you know, you really need to do your own cigar. And so I thought, well, what am I gonna do different? And that was kind of like the Twitter thing and leveraging yeah. social media. Was the first person to put my Twitter account on the outside of the band. So if people are like looking at it, and if you don't know what Twitter is, you're like, I don't know what that is, but guys that do are like, oh, I didn't know he had that. And I'm like, let's see if he answers, and I do. So, um, you know, I, I started with the first cigar, and I started, I was introduced to some people in Dominican Republic, yeah. and that's my classic line, and that's what I started with. And it's a very classic Dominican that's got great reviews, and, and, and construction-wise, I think, holds up against anybody else coming out of DR. And then I, uh, last year, beginning last year, I went into Nicaragua because a lot of the guys in the cigar industry are like, you got to come to Nicaragua, you got to check out the tobacco. And to me, it's always been like I said, you know, I, I say what I do right, what I do wrong. It's a check the ego at the door. And these people, I could spend the rest of my life trying to learn about tobacco in just some region and not know near as much as the guys that are there. So you lean on the guys that are there. So I went to Nicaragua, I had all the tobaccos laid out. You roll just that leaf and you smoke it and you make notes and get the flavor. Then you go, okay, well, what does it taste like with this? And you put them together. And so I came up with the lot 1386 was an LE, which was last year was my first IPCPR. Uh, it sold out. So there's no more of those left. So it was, you know, it was kind of one of those things like, well, I hope it's good. This is my journey into Nicaragua. Then I uh, approached uh, AJ Fernandez because I wanted to do a, a production cigar in Nicaragua. And that's how we came out with the S307, which was the box press Sumatra. And that's done very well. And then I just last week released what's called the Connecticut Fuerte, which was kind of that, and it's funny because I don't, I'm not, again, I, you know, you, you leave the ego at the door, but yeah. I really thought, well, you know, okay, I blended this, I blended this. Con Connecticut, that's easy, because those are mild, you know, and I'm like, that was the most frustrating experience ever. Because I could see that, actually. It was ridiculous. I mean, literally, like, I, I'm getting angry. I'm, I'm like, you know, I, I shelved it for six months. And then, and then uh, in working with the guy I work with, he says, you know, we could do a different spin on it. So we started playing some other. So the idea was on the Connecticut Puerto is it's not your father's Connecticut. You know, so it's a Connecticut. And what I'm finding is that I was trying to take a Connecticut and get a little bit more, another layer of strength. So I took actually some Nicaraguan Lajero to put in there yeah. and give it a little bit more strength. And then what came back was, is that the Nicaraguan smokers that said, you know, I don't smoke Connecticut's anymore. They're yeah. smoking and going, you know what, I like this. Yeah. I can dial back a little bit or I can have this for breakfast or whatever it is yeah. and give them something else. So that those are all out. And I just put together put together a blend that will come out probably around June, which is, I'm not going to name the name yet because I haven't solidified that, but the, but it's basically, it's a more aggressive smoke from the standpoint, it's a stronger profile. It's stronger than the 307. has five different fillers to it. It's a Maduro wrapper, a Habano Oscuro wrapper that's gorgeous. And that was a very aggressive one, but now I'm starting having a much better understanding of the blends, how different things interact with each other. But at the end of the day, I'm just having fun. I'm just, I feel like the, you know, I feel like the kid in the Make-A-Wish Foundation that's like allowed to run a cigar company, you know, uh, and just have a good time. And fortunately, the market has really responded to it. Last year, well, you guys have been here a year now. Yeah. So last year when you started, I think I was maybe in 30 stores. Uh, I'm in a, uh, just over 140 now, and we're doing about four to five new stores a week right now. So, wow, um, so it's really taken off. That's really yeah. nice. Yeah. So when you talk about the profile of all the sticks that you just listed, are are you trying to fill a portfolio? In other words, are you are you going down the list and checking a box and say, hey, listen, when I envision Nomad cigars, I really would like to have a Connecticut. I'd like to have a really solid Maduro. Are you? Are you uh, going from your own personal preference as to what cigar is next, or are you working from more of a big picture where you're like, you know what, I want to do, I don't know, Corojo. I want right, to do whatever right. that is. I think initially I was, and I think that's a trap. Because, for example, the 307 I went in, and, and this is going to sound really like marketing or esoteric, but the 307 when I went in to blend that, 
it was supposed to be a stronger cigar. And what I learned over the course of several months of blending in Nicaragua is that my job is not to just go, look, I'm making a strong cigar. My job is to, and as a boutique we can do this because we can find smaller batches of unique tobacco yeah. that I can make 100,000 sticks and say, okay, I've got an LE or I can do whatever. And the big guys, it just gets lost in the shuffle. So Absolutely. what I started to change my mindset when I was getting frustrated is I said, you know what, instead of saying I need this profile stick, if I find really good tobacco, then it's my job, what can I blend with it to really showcase that tobacco for what it's supposed to be? That's why the 307 ended up to be probably a seven and a half out of 10 strength as opposed to being stronger because that's what that needed to be. The box press Sumatra, the, the, the Esteli Lajero and everything else, that's just what that ended up being. So n the answer to your question is, um, I think initially I thought that, yeah. but in the very beginning, of course, I'm thinking, man, I'm just happy to have one cigar people are buying. Right. Um, I think that I revisited that when I went back to blend, and I actually came up with two blends I like, and the choice of releasing the one in June is because it's a more full-bodied, more, much more complex cigar. So that was a portfolio choice. Okay. But for the most part, now I'm just playing with lots of different blends, and what do I like? The Connecticut, for example, every Connecticut I was smoking was just like boring, boring, not unique, like everyone else on the shelf. Yep. And I, so I didn't want to fill a slot just to say, I now have a Connecticut. Right. If I'm gonna put out a cigar, I want it to be my cigar and something I enjoy. And the problem I had initially on the Maduros was, is I don't smoke a ton of Maduros, and so I didn't want to put out a cigar just to fill a portfolio slot. Right. It had to be something that I would smoke. And, and that's, to me, that drives the process now. So when we talk about cigars that you like to smoke prior to House of Emilio, Prior to Nomad, what were you smoking? What could we, if we popped open a Herfador, what, I mean, give me three or five cigars that got you really jazzed about, particularly as you were closer to coming into the cigar right, industry. Right. What were those ones late in the game where you were going, yeah, that's really good, or I want to aspire to be right, something right. like that? I would say um, on the Dominican side, I really like a lot of the Avos. Yeah. Um, I really like the classics. I really like some of the other ones. Some of his older ones I really liked. Um, you know, some of the other guys, I, I have a lot of respect for Dion and Illusion. I really I really think the dude's just got a mad palate. It's incredible. Um, you know, he's like the rest of us. We're all this motley looking crew that we look like she's doing moonshine instead of cigars. <laughs> I mean, we're all just as band of weird people. We but can't we can't relate to that. Yeah, really. yeah. We, <laughs> we blend in with everybody. <laughs> well, yeah, but, but I mean, I really respect what he's done. Yeah. Um, I have a lot of respect for Jonathan Drew, uh, Sam Lucia, I mean, people that are willing to not say, you know, or not be a fifth generation cigar maker saying, look, we have to make it the way our father made it, whose grandfather made it, and things like that. These are guys that are going in and relatively playing with the same tobacco, but you know what, let's do something different. Yeah. I don't want my father's cigar. I don't want, you know, I want to do something different. So I tend to gravitate towards those people that aren't afraid to play with tobacco. And even if it's a cigar that's not on my profile, I respect if they did it and fully committed to that cigar. Yeah. So those are a couple guys that, that I would say definitely I would gravitate towards, uh, whether I smoke all their cigars or not, depends on who you're talking about. But just guys that really aren't afraid to just go, you know what, I want to do something different. And they, they commit to it. It's, it's like watching a movie that has a horrible, horrible, depressing ending but you still like the movie because you're like, man, they just committed and won all out to the end on it. Yeah. And, 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 and what happens is, is that these guys come up with some stellar cigars in the process because they weren't trying to blend for everybody. They were blending for something specific they really wanted out of that tobacco. Yeah. And, and piggybacking on Sam, and we just had the pleasure uh, two weeks ago of driving out to his uh, man cave, which sits in the back of his house. It's literally a renovated garage. Uh, but he's done a really nice job with it. Um, you know, you talk about the culture of, for you both, going into an industry that has a, a, a very rich history, right, for a lot of the families that go back. Yeah. And, and you think about the groups, uh, Blanco is a name that comes, they're everywhere. I mean, if they right. weren't in one place, they're now in another place, and somebody's a cousin, which is terrific, actually. It's, it's one of the attributes of the community that I, I like about it, but you and, and Sam come in from the outside. How are you received by that group? That, that, that's an excellent question, and, and I wasn't sure when I walked into it how it would be with either either boutiques or people who've been around forever. I think what I've found for myself is, and, and you know, obviously mad respect to those people and, and what they do and what they still do, 
Uh, I think when you go in, like I did, and like I said, it's a check of ego at the door, and you want to learn. When I thought they would be very close to the vest and go, look, I've got these secrets, and I'm not sharing them. They get passed right. down to my son and, you know, whatever. What I found was is that if you went in with the right mindset and you were respectful and passionate about the art and passionate about tobacco, all the doors open as far as what they're willing to share. If they see that you're sincere and you're passionate about the art of creating a cigar and the blending of a cigar, I found them to be totally open. And I was amazed how many of them, even though they would never necessarily admit it publicly yeah. and may not smoke my cigar, they're still respectful because at some point in their lives or their parents' lives, that was somebody that was doing something that probably wasn't like their parents did or grandparents did. Yeah. So they see that. And, 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 and if you're doing it, like I said, for the right reasons, I think they're very, very open to someone going out and playing. And, and, and it's almost like, you know, I imagine to them, like watching a kid play in a play, playground and go, man, have fun. I used to be that. I used to do some of that. Absolutely. And some of them, of course, still do. And I don't, I don't mean anything disrespectful, but yeah. I think if you're true to the art form, uh, I think that they're very they're very open to that. Oh, that's, that's uh, very good to hear. Uh, that isn't altogether surprising to me. On some level, on some level, it is. I'm not saying it's all like that. I'm just saying a large number. But a large <laughs> number. Well, listen. In, in every group, you're going to have certain people for, and and maybe for all the right reasons, like you said, this is a business, and if they have certain things that they like to hold close to the vest, I certainly can't criticize them. For and, that, but largely speaking, you feel embraced. Yeah, and I think it's good for the industry. If you're out there trying to promote a cigar and you create a cigar that you enjoy and you have a following, it's overall good for the industry yeah. because we end up with more cigar smokers. Yeah. There's there's never been a better time to be a cigar smoker. Uh -huh. You walk into that humidor and I mean there are a lot of great cigars at a great price point. We we were just having a conversation that we think it's the second renaissance of cigars. Now, I should say it's a second renaissance, as I, as I know it. I'm, I'm not quite 40 yet, and I remember the 90s obviously had a big boom, but it feels like now, like you said, you, you go into Trey's Humidor, it's stunning, the quality of cigar. Everywhere you go, there's not a bad one in the group. It's absolutely loaded with folks that have the right flavor, have the right construction, the right burn. I mean, it's really hard to be critical of any of those. I mean, we, we've come across a couple, but sure. But it's sure. the exception; it's not the rule. So yeah, and I think the surge is really at the boutique level. Yes. I mean, and, and there's always the well, how do you define a boutique and stuff like that? But I think it's that it's that level of cigars that you know you're seeing more and more boutique cigars taking over more and more of a humidor. Yes. You're seeing stores that would have never brought in boutiques before start to embrace boutiques and go, you know what, I'm seeing how they're selling, I'm seeing a different audience, I'm seeing a, a younger audience, another generation, if you will, and um, they're all looking for their own identity, and now, because of all the boutiques, I think they're finding an identity, Yeah. and and that's why I look at, you know, and again, you know, within the House of Emilio, I look at, you know, Ezra Zion, and, and, and 1502, and myself, and Steve Sidron, and a lot of people that are, that, and, and the others, obviously, that, are, that aren't afraid to play, but all of a sudden have found a following very quickly. I would not have grown to where I've grown in such a short period of time if it wasn't for that audience out there hungry for, for that. Yeah, I yeah. think that's right. Often what we compare it to is I'm a craft beer drinker, right? So we have a Same lot of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like there's a great uh, parallel between what we're seeing and to that end what's happening in the craft beer uh, arena is that the, the, the big guys in the market are obviously taking notice for all the same reasons. Oh, and you have crazy stuff now. The they're circling there. back to buy some of the more boutique uh, oh, yeah. brews. Are you anticipating, and so are, are, has that ever crossed your mind that, hey, listen, this is happening so rapidly. I mean, you just put the statistics out there. This is happening so quickly that you may get a phone call one day from, I'm trying to think of a, a general or an uh, altidus or somebody like that to say, hey, listen, this is, this is dynamite. And we need, as a, as a corporate uh, group of this size, to begin to play in that space. What would you think? Is that is that attractive to you, or are you well, anti-establishment? No, no, no. I, I think that you know it brings some to the table. I mean, I, I've I've talked to some companies because yep. they've approached on some stuff, and and 
you know, you have you weigh it out because you know sometimes when you get bought out, then then even if you're still participating, you get lost in the shuffle. If they've right. got this massive portfolio or something like that, it's. You know, it, it's kind of like when there's the hottest, latest social media thing, and the second your parents get on, it's like, oh man, all the kids are off, and I'm not yeah. doing it anymore. Yeah. So, but on the other hand, there's a certain amount of resources there. There's a lot of things that would be very attractive as to what their business model is. I don't know. If it was me, if you're talking pure business, and I'm not going to name one of the companies yes. or whatever, but I would go look. You know, I would personally, from a business perspective, I would go find five probably big players that are really up and coming that you could probably invest in or buy part of or partnership with for relatively small dollars in their scheme of the world and go, look, I only need one or two of them to succeed. Absolutely right. The question is, can you, if, if you do that, can you maintain that uniqueness Correct. That, that you're growing, or do you get lost in There's the a shelf life. Exactly. Do you exactly. Dis, do you disappear? Do you get, uh, what's the word, homogenized yes. into their, you know, what makes you great is that you can turn on a dime. You, you, you can do something different. You know, I, you know okay, so Twitter, you know, I imagine if there was a company that'd be going, oh, you know, I don't want you tweeting this. I don't, I don't. You can't, you can't say that. You can't, you can't. You know, like I do my April Fool's joke thing every day, and this year is probably going to take people off. And they'd be like, oh no, you can't do that. You know, so, so do you lose the heart of the company when you go to another? Now, if you can maintain that independence, it could be, a, it could be a very good relationship, yeah. very profitable for both groups. I'm actually surprised we haven't seen more of that. That we haven't seen those guys take notice of the landscape. And doing exactly what you just mapped out and saying, you know, statistically, two, two to three of the five that we go for, this is good for everybody. Yeah. We can, we yeah. can support that. And you, and you might. I don't know. Like I said, I don't know their business models. And in the end of the day, we're still relatively small. So yeah. they're like, you know, look, we, we, we move more sticks out of, you know, this region than they move the entire country. So yeah. they may go, look, it's not enough to be on the radar. But... We've seen companies bought out before, yeah. and we've seen companies, you know, I, like I said, if it was me, I, I, there, I suspect, well, I know for sure that a couple of them are kind of keeping an eye on a couple yeah. of us going, man, if this gets any more traction, we got to look at it. And then you have a decision to make whether you think you can, you can protect the integrity of your brand if you have a partnership like that. Yeah, that makes, that makes perfect sense. Is there anything you wanted to cover, Vince, in terms of, is there anything that you wanted to promote that we didn't cover. We tend to, like I said, we like off the wall yeah, I, things I'm like. I'm going to this down for YouTube stuff. Mention website and all social media. Yeah, okay. yeah, absolutely. So tell us how, for people that uh, don't have Nomad yet inside of their local humidor, how do they start following and find out more about the Nomad? Um, the website that I have is nomadcigarcompany.com. And I try to keep up on listing the retailers. There is a retailer map, and we try to update it every week for the new retailers. Uh, Twitter's Godfather, G-O-D-F-A-D-R. Uh, if you go to the website also, I have an e-letter that goes every, out every week, which is ridiculously stupid. Um, but for some reason, we're just, I'm just having too much fun with it. Uh, and then, you know, I do giveaways and stuff like that. And I don't do a lot, but I mean, I've been doing some monthly contests that have some great prizes and cigars. Uh, and then, you know, try to catch out, you know, events and stuff. I try to get out and, and, and do things like this. Are you on the road a lot? Um, you know, not as much as some of the other guys. Uh, I started the thing, I love to travel, and I just came back from Nicaragua after spending two months in Nicaragua. So um, I'm not on the road probably as much as I should be, and I'm starting to go on the road more. Okay. But that's why I tried to leverage social media as much so that I could always have that conversation. Yeah. A year ago, 30 stores, it's easy. Now 140, boy, I'd have to go on the road you know, the entire year to catch all the stores, so it's just not going to happen. So that's why I try to make sure... First and foremost, I'm accessible on my Facebook page. I'm, you know, someone looks at the cigar and they see the Twitter thing on there, and if they send me a tweet, I typically respond. Yeah. You know, or I retweet it or whatever. So um, I try to keep that conversation, that relationship, using the tools that we kind of have now. Yeah. So you mentioned living in LA for a year. Where is home base for you now? Uh, I mentioned living in LA for a year. Didn't you say you were in LA for a year? I was, but I was like 14, so I don't. Oh, know that, I'm know. sorry. I thought you were doing. No, kind of, I, kind of spooky research yeah. now. All of a sudden, <laughs> stalker. <laughs> restraining order. <laughs> yeah, yeah, restraining order. I don't know why. why did, where did that come? I did where live did in. I, I did live in LA for a year, but it's kind of creepy because I didn't think anybody knew that. So uh, really, I was like, I said that as like. 
Oh, for that. So, yeah. All right, we'll strike. Edit that out because clearly I have no idea what I'm talking about. It's the craft beer. Right. It's not even if you. I wish. The peanut butter porter, sweet baby Jesus. Yeah. Wow. Uh, I had that the other day. Someone gave me that. I, someone gave me that the other day. I'm like, really? Peanut butter talking to beer? And I'm like, this is like the stupid. That's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's all right. Yeah. That is so all. I actually just came out with one that's a chocolate raspberry. I mean, we were literally, we were eating Hershey's Kisses and doing the sweet, ba drinking the su sweet baby Jesus at the DC tweet up. And I feel like like I'm a drug addict. I'm like mainlining heroin and doing this at the same time. <laughs> Speedball coming. You know, it was really, but it was good. You know, I'm not a huge beer drinker, but I mean, I, the, the, I mean, you walk into like a store that carries a lot of that stuff now, yeah. and I'm like, one, the names are wild. Yeah. I'm looking at these names going, man, they've got the coolest names ever. But just the diversity and what, I mean, they'll put anything in there. It's like, you know, pale ale, juju bead. I don't know. I mean, yeah. they just got, you name it. It's like, there's a beer for it. Yeah. Which I'm all fully in support of. Well, it tastes good. Yeah. So anything you wanted to cover? I think that kind of wrapped it up. That was good. Thank you for spur of the moment doing that with us. That's, yeah, that's no, awesome. I mean, just definitely, you know, check out the cigars and, and, and um, you know, finally got to the point in the portfolio where I think there's probably one that, that fits what you're going for. And I mean, the nice thing about myself and, like, you know, the other guys in the house of Emilio is that, you know, if, if you're talking to me in an event and this floored somebody the other day, it's like, look, if my cigar is not the right one for you, I'm not going to push my cigar on you. Yeah. I want you to have the cigar that's right for you, and I'll probably recommend something else from one of my colleagues or yeah. outside even House of Emilio to find you the right cigar. And and what's working for us is just that it's almost refreshing to people going, wow, the guy's not hammering his stick. He's like, you know, this is this is the best one ever, you know. So. You're so right. Most of the time we ask the questions, and that's I wanted to make sure that we had we predate your time with House of Emilio and what you like to smoke and most often people are actually really good but we have you know without naming names had a couple of guys and they they won't they're like i i smoke my own see i and i, 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 I don't, get it i i but don't, I I'm don't get that. that i don't get that i think i think, I think, I think yeah i smoke smoke i think honestly <laughs> if you're if you're a <laughs> smoke, 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 smoke. but anyway uh, if you're if you're if you're not smoking your own cigar what's the best cigar out there to smoke Oh, the best cigar? Oh, Cubans. I only smoke Cubans. Yeah, you know, I, I think, and, and I'm not going to pick, I mean, I don't even know who that was. I think if you say, honestly, and in, in, in all honesty, if you're saying the only cigar you smoke is your own, yeah. then you're either being incredibly hypocritical or you're a jackass. No, um, you're just, you're just... You're either you're just close my. It's totally irresponsible to say that. And if you really believe that, then man, I, I guess more power to you. But um, I could, ne I'd never be. I mean, you know, I'm, I've got, I, my one humidor probably has more of like, you know, uh, Willie Herrera's new cigar on the oh, on the row yeah. than than my other, than my own sticks on that row. You know, yeah. so um, you know, I just think that there's so many great cigars out there. And there's no embarrassment in saying that, you know what, this guy's got an outstanding, Jose Blanco, I can't wait to see his new yeah. cigar. That's because exciting. he doesn't have anybody above him now. This is going to be his baby. Yeah. And so, I mean, you know, to say that, 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 that no one else has a cigar better than mine, it's ridiculous. Yeah. It, really, it really is. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you answering that honestly because, I, like I said, it's not often, but every it's happened more than once. We've had a couple of guys and it's just, nope. I smoke my own, and I always find that a bit like really, and I irresponsible is a great is a great way to define that because in my head I'm going, isn't it part of the business to kind of keep the palate, you know, trying these different things to go, you know, I never would have thought about you that. Know, That's an interesting. It's, blend, it's funny you said that. One of my famous moment moments is is actually what happened three weeks ago when I put the next stick blend to bed because when I'm blending I have a tendency not to have the other sticks. When I put it to blend, I can't remember the cigar, but I went home and I lit up somebody else's cigar, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I get to smoke someone else's cigars yeah. now. But when I'm when I'm in the middle of blending stuff, I don't I don't cloud it with anything else. So so and and I don't mean to pick on anybody. If somebody really does think that they've got a portfolio that all their cigars are the best and nothing else is good, hey, maybe you're that good. Maybe or maybe, maybe that's just your palate, yeah. and the only ones you like are the ones you blended for you because yeah. if you're doing it right, you're blending cigars that you like. But beyond that, like I said, when I got done blending. There are probably about five different guys that I'm like, man, I, I mean, I haven't tried this for like two months, and I want to have this one, I, you know, one one ever, and that's a, that's a refreshing time. Yeah, I complete. But what what is your prop? By the way, we, there's another question we'd like to ask is, everybody's process is is different from a couple of different angles. The amount of time, what's this? You know, how long does it typically take you 
Because I imagine it's actually changing, because like you said, the more you do it, are you refining the process instead of taking six months? Are you down to five months? I mean, what? I'm quicker at some stages, and I'm longer in others. In the beginning, it, you know, when you don't know much, it's like you're only tasting subtle nuances. So it's that part's easy, but I never understood how someone would have a blend they like and they're tweaking the blend and tweaking the blend and tweaking the blend over and over and over again. It's kind of like, you know, when you don't know what you don't know, it's easier. Yeah. As you learn more, some parts of the process shortcut are much quicker, but it also opens up a door of a whole lot of other things that you start going, okay, well, what's going to happen to this in six months? What's going to happen to in a year? What's going to happen if I do this type of fermented tobacco versus another type? So, um, so I think the overall process is, is relatively quicker, but the complexity gets great, which adds more to the process. Yeah, so that you makes know, sense. Which is probably a totally non-committal answer, but uh, no, I think that's I, no, I think that's an honest one. What what is the ideal when you're making a blend? What what is the size of the cigar? that you're smoking to say, yep, I've got it, and now I'm going to pull that out into whatever it may be. Because I, it, to some degree, it's a personal preference. Vince and I thought that we had it figured out of what that cigar size is. We thought everybody was doing the same thing, and recently we're finding out that it's more person to person of what how they're doing it. So what are you using the Well, I mean some guys I would say most I do Toros. Okay. I think some guys actually do smaller ring gauges than, than I do on average. Um, I mean I don't know but it's, I, I don't know anybody that's like, you know, six by sixty, you know, and that's yeah. that's the test blind on there. Um, I, I, I tend to do Toros, uh, I, I can't tell you why other than that's a that's a size profile that I, I, I just kinda have a better idea where it's gonna go either way. I've noticed that I in the last round I start to play with a slightly smaller ring gauge on that, but that's usually about where I, where I start. Well, that's usually between the, the two most popular that when we do these interviews that we've heard, it started with something like a Corona mm -hmm. that they that that the blenders thought that they were getting the true balance of filler to wrapper and so forth. And then recently, what we're hearing more of is Toro. Right. And one of the gentlemen that we spoke to, the, the rationale was, listen, Toros sell very well. Mm -hmm. uh, why would you not use right. a Toro right. when, by volume, that's what's moving off the shelves? And that actually made perfect sense to me. I was like, geez, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I, I, mine's always been Toro until this last one. I did drop down size-wise, but when I, it's funny, I drove, I dropped down size-wise at the table doing it, but when it came down to roll me 200 of them, put them away for 45 days and let me start smoking them, I went back to the Toro. Interesting. Um, but I don't, I don't know in my life, I mean, Sor Toros obviously sell. Uh, I think it's just a size that I'm comfortable getting all the flavors in yeah. it, I guess. Are you, we, Vince and I, and, and I have to give Vince credit. Uh, Vince to. in the last, no. I don't have to, I, he gets cranky. Uh, yeah, but <laughs> he uh, he turned me on to Lanceros most recently, which for good reason I understand it again from a business perspective, not a great thing to make because they just simply don't move the way that the other ones do. But would you ever consider doing uh, more limited edition, even in sizes like a Lancero? Why? Well, I'm glad go? you asked that question. No, I do have a Lancero coming out. Do you really? Yeah, I do. Actually, I, I do. That was not staged, by the no, way. No, no, no. I, 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 I actually. Sincere. That what was, what uh, happened was is is two months ago I was at the factory. The Connecticut Forte was done. It was being released, and just for whatever reason, I was playing with some other sizes. I was playing with the Bellicoso and some other things, and I had them roll me two bundles of Lanceros just to take home, because. You're right. There's not a huge market, but the people that are Lancero smokers are really, really passionate really? about Lancero. Yes. Um, I remember talking to Jose Blanco about it, saying, man, I'm having trouble on the blend on a Lancero because it's a totally different animal, just as, as, as doing a 6x60 would be in the opposite end of the spectrum. So um, just as a fluke, I, I talked to my guys and blend me, you know, you know, knock me out some Lanceros. I took them home. I smoked a couple. I took a picture of it. And the number of tweets I got back going, really? oh my God, give me one, I want one, whatever. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to do a limited number. Um, I'm doing like 300 boxes or something like that. And it's not that I can't do more, 
because uh, it's a production cigar. Yeah. So I can do them. I just said, you know what? Give me 300 boxes. Let me throw them out there. At least, you know, the Lancero fans. It ended up being good in the Connecticut Fuerte. I tried it in the Classic Habana line, but I didn't like it as much. The, the, the blend would have to tweak a lot more. The Connecticut Fuerte, we got it right. So yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna release that probably in the next couple months here. Oh great! Uh, just just for the Lancero kind of fans. Well, as a fan of Lanceros, thank you for for doing that. <laughs> yeah, we'll first be, box is sold. We'll be in that. We'll be in that. Well, listen, thank you for taking time out thank of your you. day. Thank you. Thank you. It's very nice. Yeah. If you haven't already checked out Nomad Cigars, stop what you're doing. Go down to your local tobacconist and make sure you get one. Thank you.